Good evening. I'd like to welcome you back tonight for our service of shadows, or tenebrae, that we began yesterday. Tonight is the most somber day in the church year as we remember the terrible agony and suffering of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's no benediction or absolution this evening, for it was on this Friday that is called good that the Savior of the world, the Lamb of God, was hung on a tree to die for all who would believe in him. Our service ends in silence tonight as we reflect on the great price that he paid to set us free. At the end of the service, I invite you to spend some time in prayer and to consider the depth of God's love for you and the length that he would go to save you. We're told in Scripture that if we claim that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and we make God out to be a liar. And he has no place in our lives. But if we willingly confess, honestly confess our sins, God is faithful and just. And he promises to forgive us and wash us clean. So we're going to take some time tonight by joining together in a confession of our sinfulness to the Lord. And this is according to the 51st Psalm. The words will be on your screen. Have mercy on me, O God. According to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Cleanse me and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Save me, O God. This I ask through Jesus Christ, your Son and my Lord. Amen. Good evening. Tonight is an unusual time for all of us. As we sit in our homes, or we're at work, or maybe some of you are driving to deliver the precious goods that we all need. But who would have thought that today we would be spending Good Friday like this. But I want to assure you that even though we join together for a somber time of reflection tonight, Sunday morning is, is still a time for celebration as we remember the miracle of Easter. Because you see, the tomb will still be empty. Our Savior will still have risen from the grave. And death, the devil, and the curse of sin will still have been utterly and completely destroyed. So tonight, as we focus on the great price that our Lord paid to set us free, and we consider the terrible cost of our, our sins, we do that with expectant joy. Because we know in the horizon, we see the empty tomb. We rejoice for Easter. Now, for obvious reasons, this evening will be a little different than what we're used to, the things that we've done in the past. But it's my hope that during our time together, the Lord will still speak to our hearts. And that we'll be able to experience the importance and the significance of what Good Friday is all about. The message tonight will be broken into five different parts. During each section, I'll share a portion of the gospel account of the Passion. And then I'll, I'll briefly explain what that means for us. And then we'll sing a verse from the song, Were You There? And as you hear the music, I want to encourage you to join with us in song or to just to sit back and let the words speak to you and think about the significance of what they mean. So this is the gospel account of our Lord's passion. Early in the morning, all the chief priests and the elders of the people came to the decision to put Jesus to death. They bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 silver coins to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us? They replied. That's your responsibility. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and hanged himself. The chief priests picked up the coins and said, it is against the law to put this into the treasury since it is blood money. 
So they decided to use the money to buy the potter's field as a burial place for foreigners. That is why it has been called the field of blood to this day. Then what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. They took the 30 silver coins, the price set on him by the people of Israel, and they used them to buy the potter's field as the Lord commanded me. A deal with the devil, we've all heard that phrase before. A choice that seems great on the surface or in the beginning, but turns out to be far from what we wanted or what we expected. You see, that's the thing about sin. It never delivers on its promise. 30 pieces of silver. It seemed like a great deal to Judas. No doubt about it. Yet nothing turned out the way that he thought it would. But you see, there's a bigger lesson in this story. Judas was a sinner, but you see, so are we. And now, now before you say, well, I'm nothing like Judas. I didn't betray Jesus. I didn't do the same things that he did. I want you to know that God doesn't work on a sliding scale. You see, either you're holy and perfect or you're not. And I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but we fall into that latter category. See, the difference with Judas was he didn't believe. He didn't believe that Jesus was his Savior. So it didn't matter that he went back to the priests and and told them what he had done, that he returned the money, or that he begged for forgiveness. You see, without Jesus, there is no forgiveness, there is no mercy. And that's the part that we need to pay attention to. That without faith in Christ, we're hopeless. We're lost. And that's the whole point of Good Friday. That Jesus died for those who would believe in Him. For those that He came to save. So I want to ask you tonight, do you believe that Jesus died for you? As we join in the first verse of the song, I want to encourage you to think about the significance of what happened on this day and what that means for you. Then the Jews led Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning, and to avoid ceremonial uncleanness, the Jews did not enter the palace. They wanted to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and asked, What charges are you bringing against this man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone, the Jews objected. This happened so that the words Jesus had spoken, indicating the kind of death he was going to die, would be fulfilled. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked? Or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. It was your people and your chief priests who handed you over to me. What is it that you've done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were... My servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. 
Jesus answered, You are right in saying, I am a king. In fact, for this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? Pilate asked. With this, he went out again to the Jews and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them one more time. But they kept shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! For the third time, he spoke to them, Why? What crime has this man committed? I have found in him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore, I will have him punished and then release him. But with loud shouts, they insistently demanded that he be crucified, and their shouts prevailed. So Pilate decided to grant their demand. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and for murder, the one that they asked for, and surrendered Jesus to their will. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. Perhaps you've seen it in a movie, the brutal portrayal of the beating that Jesus received. Maybe you've seen it in a picture or read about it somewhere online. Whatever the case may be, it's an image that stays with you. It's hard to forget. Haunting, unimaginable, gruesome. Those are some of the words that people use to describe it. On each strand of the scourge or the flagellum to have before us, there were pieces of bone or bronze tied to each piece. And there were often two or more lictors or those who would swing the whip alternating, striking the prisoner. Maximum pain, maximum damage. According to Jewish law, a criminal could be sentenced to 40 lashes minus one. Anything more than that was considered a death sentence. Roman law, on the other hand, had no limits. When Jesus was praying in the garden on Monday, Thursday, he asked his Father in heaven, he said, if it's all possible, Lord, take this cup from me. You see, Jesus knew full well what was coming and what he would have to endure. We're told the very thought of it caused him to sweat blood. Hematidrosis is the medical term for it. It's an extremely rare disorder that comes on from extreme stress or fear. But you see, the thing is, it wasn't the beating that he was concerned about. Jesus was to be our sacrificial lamb. The Lamb that would take away the sins of the world. But to do that, He'd have to bear the punishment for every sin that was ever committed by anyone that ever did or will live. It's hard to even imagine what that would mean. So He received the full wrath of God. And it would take place all in one day, the day that we call Good Friday. Have you ever considered how much Jesus endured for us? Have you ever considered how much He endured for you? As we sing the second verse of our song, I want to encourage you to think about the depth of Jesus' love. How deep that must have been to be willing to go through all of that just to save you. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand and knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. 
After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. After Jesus was beaten nearly to death, the soldiers made the most of their opportunity by amusing themselves at Jesus' expense. The color scarlet or purple was to mock his claim of nobility and the staff to show his lack of authority. They took a few strands of thorns and twisted them into a makeshift crown. We don't know the exact species that was used, but scholars agree that each spike was long enough to stick well into his skull. Little did they know that this man that they mocked and they insulted really was a king. He was their king. He's our king as well. In the Muslim quarter of the Jerusalem city, there's a place called the Church of the Flagellation. And on the ceiling above the altar, gilded in gold, is a giant crown of thorns. Some believe that it was on this site that Jesus was mocked and crowned king of the Jews. It's hard to imagine the humiliation or the indignities that our Lord suffered on that day. He'd been rejected and condemned by the very same people that he came to save. Jesus once asked his followers, who do you say that I am? And he asks the same question of us. C.S. Lewis, the famous author of the Narnia Tales, once said that we only have a few choices to pick from when we describe Jesus. We can deny that He is the Christ, the Messiah. We can call Him a liar and a fraud. We can take all that He's done and chalk that up as the ravings of a madman. Or, we can admit that He truly is the Son of God. We have to make a decision. Scripture tells us that because of His great love for us, God sent His only Son to save us. So either Jesus is your Lord and your Savior, or He isn't. He's either died to save us, or He didn't. You see, there is no middle ground. So who do you say He is? During our next verse, I want you to use this time to think about that and to ask yourself, who is Jesus to you? Pilate said, don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jews kept shouting, if you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of Passover week, about the sixth hour. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. As they led him away, they, si they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country. 
and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, there they crucified him, along with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. You know, we've all heard the story from our grandparents about walking to school uphill both ways, of course. But the thing about Jerusalem is no matter where you're at, everything seems to be uphill. After Jesus had been brought out to the crowds a final time, he was taken away to be crucified. That was the punishment for slaves and for those who were criminals convicted of serious or heinous crimes. Jesus, along with two other men, were given the patibulum, this beam, a horizontal piece that goes on the cross. And they were forced to carry it until they reached their place of execution. Now, as a deterrent and to reduce the chances of an uprising, they would take these people to the outskirts of the city. So prisoners would have to carry this beam weighing sometimes over 80 pounds for close to a mile uphill on uneven ground over rough terrain. And for Jesus, who was bruised, tired, and bleeding, that meant every agonizing step, every breath would bring new pain and misery. The Via Dolorosa, the way of suffering. But he knew that the cross at Calvary meant freedom. Not for him, you see, but for us. And not even the devil himself could stop Jesus from getting there. Can you picture Jesus making that journey for you? As we sing our, our final verse of the song tonight, consider everything that happened on that day, that day that was for you and for me. God became one of us. God lived among us, suffered for us, and died in our place just so that we could be with Him. And you know, when you think about it, there's no greater love than that. Yet, it was our sins, each and every one of us, that made it all necessary. This is our final reading and the conclusion of the passion of our Lord. At the end of the service, I want to encourage you to take a few minutes for reflection and for prayer. Remember, it was our sin that made his suffering and his death necessary. But on the other side of that, don't lose sight of the fact that our God is a God of the living and the miracle of Easter is right around the corner. At the place of the skull, they crucified him and with two others, one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but that this man claimed 
to be king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled, which said, They divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. So this is what the soldiers did. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now, if he wants him. For he has said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the robbers who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a stick, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his life. Now it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jews did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. These things happened so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. Three nails, one between the bones in each wrist and another piercing his heels. Dying on a cross was the cruelest, most humiliating method of execution that the Romans could come up with. But that was the point. It was meant to be an image of terror, something to bring fear into the hearts of all who witnessed it. The process was slow and it often lasted for days, asphyxiation being the final cause of death. Men were stripped naked while guards would hold their arms in place until the nails were driven through the flesh and into the wood. Once the cross was placed in the vertical position, the victim would need to lift themselves up, pushing against the nails in their feet to fill their lungs with air and then lower their body, putting stress on the nails in their wrists to breathe out. And this would continue until they were either too tired or in too much pain to go on, leading to suffocation and death. On certain occasions, to speed up the process, the criminal's legs might be broken. But there was one absolute in all of this. No one survived a Roman crucifixion. So at a place called Golgotha, with all that was required complete, Jesus gave up his spirit and died. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb, and went away. My friends know that it was our sins, the sins of the world, that brought this about. And so on this day called Good Friday, we remember that it was each of us, in our own way, responsible. Each of us 
had a turn swinging the hammer. Each of us had forged our own nails. And as Jesus, the Lamb of God, hung on the cross, heaven and hell watched and waited when He breathed His last and the stone was rolled in to seal the tomb. The devil smiled joyfully to himself. The curse of sin and death was victorious. Or so he thought. And throughout the world, the people cried, O dire dread, the Son of God is dead. 